So, um, Cal, where and when were you born? I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, at the Philadelphia Naval Hospital, actually, um, on January 2nd, 1953. I was a Navy brat. So, uh huh. Uh, actually, up there because my mother was visiting her parents in New Jersey, but we actually lived in New Haven, Connecticut. And so <laughs> that makes you a Capricorn, who is a, right. an Earth right. sign. Do you identify with that at all? Uh, not a whole lot. No. <laughs> okay. Um, professional. <laughs> uh, Raina, where and when were you born? I was born in a small town called Mundi Bahawaldeen in Pakistan. And that was in um, October 11th, 1953. On October 11th, 1953. So that makes you a Libra. Yes. They like justice and fairness and are refined and artistic. That sounds like you. Absolutely to sounds like me. <laughs> okay. And then how did you get from Pakistan to the east coast of the U.S.? My dad, um, when I was only about two years old, had come uh, to, well, I guess had decided to further his education. So he applied to come to the United States. And he came out here to get his education. And once he finished, he actually wanted to go back to Pakistan and get a job and stay there. But uh, given there were some religious conflicts there and uh, uh, difficulty getting a job, because he was a minority of a minority religion, he decided to bring us all here because he was very much educated, education minded, and wanted us all to get a good education. And how many siblings do you have? I have a older brother and a younger sister. Mm -hmm. And then how old were you when you came to the States? I was 11 years old. And had you grown up speaking English and Urdu or what, what had you grown up speaking? I grew up uh, knowing uh, languages uh, Urdu and Punjabi and also reading Arabic. There were some common words, Arabic words, that we did use quite a bit, but it wasn't a fluent language for us, like Urdu and Punjabi was. Right. So was it a big culture shock for you? What Did you go to Connecticut, or what state were you in? New Jersey. New Jersey. Like New Jersey. Um, it was, I think it was, but it wasn't so shocking that I wasn't able to adapt. I think kids are very flexible and they just, you know, whatever environment they have, they learn to adapt to it. So I believe that's what I did. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that there's different branches of Islam. And you you are part of one that's, as you say, a minority and, and is somehow treated as as problematic in countries like Pakistan. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I, I don't want to discuss too much of that, um, but uh, yes, we are a different sect. We believe in a prophet, or let me just generalize it, uh, believe in a prophecy that we will continue to have prophets to guide us. Uh, however, Prophet Muhammad is still the final prophet in that he brought the final message uh, with the Quran with him. So I don't, I don't want to say too much because there's a lot of misunderstandings um, and, you know, we don't want to get into that for this interview, I don't think. Okay. Um, yeah. And then, Cal, what, what kind of religious background was your family? How did they raise you, if, if I may ask? <laughs> well, that's a good question. So I was born in the Philadelphia Naval Hospital, whisked up to Connecticut. My parents got divorced or separated a couple years later. We moved back to New Jersey, North Jersey. And so my father, being Italian, was Catholic. At the ripe old age of two, I had no sense of anything religious-wise. When we moved to northern New Jersey, uh, we still didn't have much going on religious-wise. And then we moved to South Jersey when my mother remarried. And... Um, 
he was Catholic, though since he uh, married a divorced woman, was excommunicated at the time. And Catholicism was much more strict about that. And uh, my mother, though, was more or less Lutheran and Presbyterian. She, uh, my grandmother was really uh, probably more Lutheran, but also, uh, oh, what's the other one? Anyway, we, we didn't practice a lot of religion, and by the time I got to junior high school, my mother decided we should have religion, so we were going to go to this Lutheran church. Oh, my, my grandmother was more Baptist. She would take us to church sometimes and, in this little town we lived in. And, you know, it was kind of fun. People were singing and all that, but I, I had no sense of what any of it meant. So I had no formal training, no real Bible reading. My grandmother would read a little of the Bible to us during certain holidays, but my brother and I, my brother's here younger, I'm the oldest, would would get antsy and, and didn't have any real grounding in it. So by the time I met Aziza, I think it's fair to say I was fairly agnostic. You know, as a junior high school kid, we weren't really interested in hanging out for uh, religious classes, and so we didn't. Um, and um, by the time I was in college, I was fairly agnostic. I was actually studying uh, um, more of the, the philosophy uh, of Buddhism at that point, you know, but we were young hippies and not that everybody did, but I really found Buddhism talk to me more than uh, a lot of religions. At that point, my considered opinion, at least, and experience with friends of mine, whether they were Jewish, Catholic, Lutheran, whatever, um, was that religion, for me, by and large, was a little too um, dogmatic. You know, they were just, this is it, and this is, this is the way, and this is how you do things. And, uh, you know, so, so I saw a lot of my friends struggling with, especially Catholics with uh, their Jewish boyfriends or girlfriends and trying to figure out how that's going to work and the family's getting upset and all that stuff. So I just saw that as, well, that, that doesn't make sense because one was working from one book, one was working from another book or a set of books, and if they were the same books, if you will, the Old Testament, the New Testament. So I, I couldn't wrap my head around, well, why is one better than the other? And, and so... But the parents were stuck in that, and we, we were, I think, the baby boomers were the generation that truly melted all of that, melted all that together. But there was still, you know, there was still stigma from, from some of my friends that they were with the wrong religious person, and, and parents made it difficult for them, and we'll find a little of that in our own conversation. But, um, so by that time, I was truly agnostic. Uh, it's not that I didn't uh, have faith or wasn't somewhat spiritual. But for me, it was more a philosophical divide, and so Buddhism to me was much more equalizing and, and to me, fair, not as dogmatic. So. When did you two meet? <laughs> we met at college in uh, 1974, maybe 75, 73. 73. Yeah. Well, yes. And how did you meet? Were you at a party? Were you in a class? What was the circumstance? Um, I had a friend from high school who went to the same college, so I went looking for her. And uh, in the process of, she introduced me to Drew when I when I met up with her. And, and we were a couple, but we were on the downslide of that couple, uh, being a couple. And so I think it's fair to say when, when I met Aziza, it was love at first sight. Okay, now this this definitely helped me decide where to <laughs> grow because Aziza was just like this, you know, wonderful, like this the glow about it, this kind of a halo, this force, this energy field for me that was much much greater and much better. So, yeah. so I think he's more spiritual than he thinks he is. <laughs> <laughs> and then, what did you think when you met? Cal, Drew, whatever we're calling him. Oh, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do with it. Um, well, um, I think I met Drew. He Cal. just Cal, sorry, I'm having a hard time with sorry. that. Um, he represented calmness to me, um, very bright. Um, and <laughs> um, let's see, he 
did he just have a way about him that he was very, very much at ease with people and respected you and had this interest in what you had to say. So even with this brief meeting when we met, I could see that in him, that his uh, facial expressions and like he paid attention, he, he listened to what you had to say. He was respectful. Yes, very respectful. And curious, interested in learning. You know, that, that's, that's a better way to describe it. He was very curious. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, um, he was very curious about life and everything. Yes. So you were you fresh persons, first year college students? How old were you when you met? Another junior year, third year. I either transferred there from another college. So you well, were twenty. Eighteen, eighteen, eighteen. Because you are that here. Twenty, I think. Twenty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you met and you liked what you saw, and then what happened next? Oh, we were just friends, and uh, just got to know each other more, and discussed uh, maybe our, you know, what we valued, what we thought of certain issues. Um, just a really good, f fun relationship. Not, you know, not not really deep or anything. We just were happy to see each other. How are you doing and how are your classes going type of thing and um, in, interesting that they weren't just like surface conversations but you know they were like we were interested definitely in what the other had to say. It's also that that particular year is when I stopped out of college and I ran out of money and uh, my parents couldn't afford to help me at all so I, everything was on me and, and I ran out of steam. And uh, so I actually left for a while, but Aziz and I were able to keep touch, you know, by periodic phone calls or little little letters or something. We didn't have email, of course, back then. Um, and so uh, we continued on our way, but I stayed out. I stopped out after my, that fall, and I stayed out until the following fall, pretty much, when I uh, had gone across country, come back, and was working as a... Uh, substitute teacher of all things for for about four months where I replaced somebody while they were out on medical leave and then um, I got a job basically in a production place saved enough money came back full-time in the in the winter and we picked up again we, we got in touch with each other and then that was where I think things really got going so. and then when did you decide okay we're gonna get married we're gonna do it right out of college we finished our final years and we decided that June we um, got married. And did your parents say, oh, we don't want someone from different faiths? Or were they like, great, we love you guys? Or what were your different sets of parents' reactions? Well, of course, I knew that my parents would not be accepting and I didn't even know how to bring it up to them. I just basically, um, after college, left with Drew and that was it. So they didn't, they didn't. It was, it was very harsh for my parents, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I knew there was just no room for discussion. Uh, my dad was a very strict religious person, and my mother was a very gentle, kind woman who just probably couldn't really handle. Uh, such a, a, you know, stark uh, situation. Did they turn around uh, over the years? Did they think, oh, we have grandchildren, we want to be part of this? Or they, Yes, they did. Um, my mother, of course, first, um, you know, she kept contact with me. And then uh, with, uh, you know, my dad... It, this is kind of interesting. I had an uncle who had come to visit. He was uh, actually my dad's uncle, who was 83 years old at the time. He came to visit my parents to America from uh, Pakistan. And he told my dad, he said, 
you know, what are you doing? This is your daughter, and uh, you must welcome her home. And that was it. So, you know, I guess that meant something to him. And I was invited over uh, with Drew, and we had dinner, and slowly we had more dinners together. And Drew was, I think, the only, after the first visit, um, they just warmed up to him. Really, really liked Drew. Oh. And did you have children at that point? We did. We had our first born by that time. Yes. So that I'm I'm assuming that that helped because babies are irresistible. Oh, of course, of course, yes. yes. And. Cal, did your parents have any thoughts about, we don't want you marrying someone from a different country, or were they like, oh, we love her, this is great? Well, um, so as contacts, uh, my, my father, my stepfather at the time, and my mother had known each other from high school, so they, they had kind of been born in the town, lived in that town, they were raised in that town kind of thing. And uh, I think it's fair to say, and said this to him, even though he's dead and gone. Uh, he was fairly racist and fairly, uh, probably typical, unfortunately, of, of white males, uh, uh, you know, uh, back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And um, so he, he was very uh, worried, but really more upset that I'd be with a woman of color. You know, you're <laughs> going to have a hard time. And, the, the, your children will not do well, and I've seen this happen before, and blah, blah, blah. And I can remember even growing up, uh, well, well, before I met Aziza, where he was a real athlete and into sports, especially baseball and football. And so I became active uh, athletically, and, and he would always talk about, it's okay to have, like, I had a black friend of mine come over to visit our house, and after he left, he, his comment to me, which I was only in, I guess the fourth grade, but I, it just still today rings out. It's, like, it's kind of like it's okay to have black people as your friend, you know, as your friends and as and teammates and stuff like that, but don't bring them home. Hmm. We don't want to see them on our front porch and that sort of thing. And and so, so to me that was so interesting because I would go home with my friend on the way home from school, and his mother would invite me in for dinner. His father would throw the football around. They never said a thing about my. Went to, to that day, I hadn't really thought about white and black. I really hadn't. But that day, I finally thought about black and white. I thought, well, that's crazy. You know, so my impression was very early there. And, and he reinforced, of course, when my bride and I got together, that um, he really believed that that, that was a, not a good omen for us. He did warm to, to uh, run up after a while. Um, welcomed her. I think at first he was a little cautious and very cautious about trying different foods or different things with, that she might introduce. But over time, really warmed her and loved her just like a daughter. So they all, things for say, all the families eventually came together. Some took a little longer. He had to get over his issue with color. And I think, frankly, some of his close friends said, well, what are you worried about? This is the 19, you know, this is 1970s. He's not, you know, 1940s anymore. So let it go. And but, we're talking about your stepfather rather than your biological father? Right. And I had no, even though my biological father had visitation rights and all that, of course, he was up in New Haven. My, my mother was now down outside of Philadelphia in southern New Jersey. He never exercised those. He, he just chose not to have any contact with us, me and my brother. And um, all I got was a call from a lawyer saying he had died. Whoa. Well, I didn't expect to be. Thank you. So we never had any contact whatsoever. And so I wouldn't know what his value would have been, but sensing, uh, again, the dogma of his parents, from what I understand from my mother, now it's a one, one side of the story, he probably would not have been happy either. But, you know, who knows? I'm not worried about that. Did he have other children, or were you, you and your brother it? Me and my brother were it from my mother with him. My understanding is that he remarried and had another... Maybe one or two kids, I can't remember. This is your biological yeah. dad. Yeah. So you yeah. may have half-siblings out there. Right. Well, we do, but again, no contact, no no attempt to connect, and 
candidly, no interest. It's like, well, if you're not interested in knowing us, we're not a whole lot interested in knowing you. Okay. So, uh, when you got married, did you talk about how you were going to teach religion to your children? Um, was, was that something you talked about? We talked about it briefly. Um, Drew, um, as he had mentioned, he was really open to a lot of religions. He didn't feel comfortable totally with the Christianity. So I let him know that, you know, I would not ever expect him to change his religion. But of course, my children would be, you know, guided in the Islamic uh, religion. Her teachings. Um, so, when you were raised, when the kids were little, did you practice Ramadan and feasts of Eid and that kind of thing? Did you did you use implement those kind of rituals, important rituals? Well, one uh, this was a little unfortunate for us. Drew and I have always lived far away from family, so we never really had family. In the areas where we lived, there weren't any mosques. So it, it was just basically little things we did at home. It was never a big festivities until we had moved to California and years, even then years later, I, we found a mosque to go to. And the kids were really very open to it. They were, uh, you can teach, from my perspective, you can teach children so much and 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 they they are open to it. They're, they are not as restrictive and judgmental and opinionated as I think we are uh, as adults uh, who have been, like Drew said, taught in a dogmatic way. So my kids have opened me up to a lot more uh, as well. You know, I think they definitely, this marriage and my children definitely have guided my perspective of religion and, um, you know, what I believe in, what makes more sense to me, rather than what someone tells me that I have to do. Um, yeah, I think for me, it, 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 as he says, or Ron is exactly right, I, I, uh, I have no qualms whatsoever about our children being uh, raised in more of an Islamic uh, tradition with some of those. I mean, they, they also experience the Christian stuff like Christmas, though we all know that's not really a <laughs> two uh, days longer, it's so commercialized. But and Easter, my my mother would, would would do that sort of thing. But beyond that, they had little to no exposure with the formal Christianity, and I think more so more Islamic. With when we visit with Aziza's or Rana's family, and if we stayed for a week or two, where they came to visit, there would be some inculcation of Islamic tradition, and it's fine. But so so for instance, we don't eat pork. And it's, it's not a big deal. Our kids have never thought, oh, God, we're missing something. <laughs> it was easy because, <laughs> this is a funny side story, as Lisa said, well, you know, we can't eat pork. And I said, really? That's no problem. <laughs> I said, well, my mother uh, and cooking were not exactly her, her uh, strong suit. So my mother grew up at a time when there was a lot of uh, sickness from pork, trichinosis and that sort of thing. So... She was bound to turn and make sure that when she prepared pork or any pork products, we were not going to be subjected to that. So I used to tease her about that she invented uh, uh, bacon bits because she would fry the bacon so much <laughs> that that's with a fork would pulverize. And my brother and I used to tease her that pork chops were really hockey pucks, so we, we just wouldn't eat it. The ham roast was like eating, uh, you know, leather. So so we, we just, so once I left home and go to college, if they had pork something, I'd take the hamburger they had. I just had no desire. So it was, uh, so well, that's not a problem. I'll eat it now. I'm not planning on eating it. So, but that's an example. That's something that carries over from a religious point of view that, and a cultural point of view that, had I loved pork, may have been an issue, but it never was. And it would have been an easy one to give up. And so to me, it was, as long as there's some sense of, of, um, religious sensibility, but being a higher red gypsy and Aziza being willing to follow me all around the country, wherever we went, there just happened to not be really any any mosque or any true formalized uh, way for Aziza to celebrate or Rana to celebrate. That was mm. um, 
so, Rana, what kind of work were you able to do being a mother of three with a husband who moved? Um, what was your major in college and what kind of work have you done? My major in college was art. And once I had children, um, I really didn't do that much of it except for when I had a window of time to do a little bit here and there. Um, but I was able to take on small jobs, part-time jobs in between uh, their school and, you know, our family time. I had a small job. I started out uh, at a, like a YM, it was like a, not quite a YMCA, but mm -hmm. some kind of a program, was it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They had a program or, where you taught art to students after school. So I was able to do that, have my kids there and um, teach other children art. So that was very, really just gave me so much confidence about my the art at that time, because it was like, I went to college for this. I don't do, I have not done any of it except for dabbled here and there. So that was a boost. And so I did that for a few years, and then we moved, of course, uh, as Drew explained, it, we had moved around quite a bit. And then I had to, again, uh, you know, at that time the kids were old enough when we had moved in 1986 that I could actually try and get a full-time job. And I was able to work for an insurance company as in, uh, yeah, we were in California. We, um, I don't know if you need to know any of that, but uh, I worked for an insurance company as a claims adjuster, a claim representative is what we were called. And that is interesting because Drew really like enjoys automobiles and uh, what his knowledge of all the things, of fixing them and etc. And I never wanted to know anything about it. I'm not interested in cars. so. Here I, I am, I end up with a job where I, I have to learn about cars. And uh, it, was, it was not great that he was there to support me in that career and learn and uh, back up my learning. So that was kind of fun that I, I ended up in that situation. But my job also required to have knowledge about injuries. So I learned a lot about the medical aspect of it too. Um, which I, you know, we've applied quite a bit. Uh, I was very fortunate to have this job. Hmm. Uh, earned a lot and uh, helped a lot of people. And and now you've gone back to painting and do, are you spending more time with art? I, I'm trying to. It kind of goes in waves now. Sometimes I paint quite a bit and sometimes it's just on hold. Got it, when inspiration comes. Um, it seems to me, I don't know if you agree with this, that the hardest part of a marriage is raising children because they're by nature selfish. They don't care if they wake you up every three hours when they're babies or you know, if they're grumpy teenagers or whatever. So if, how, how, how have you dealt with raising three children and making time for the couple relationship as well? I think Drew and I just kind of fell into a routine. We're, I think, by nature, very structured, both of us. Um, we like things to be a certain way. We like to get things done. Uh, so that part was easy for us, you know, the, the cooking, cleaning, and exercising, or taking the kids out. So all those things were fun. You know, and changing diapers, feeding kids. Yeah. yeah, Drew helped in every way, so which, which is really wonderful. He was, a, he has been a very supportive husband um, and a team player with everything, whether well, you issues, you if, whether it's just issues that I'm dealing with myself. He's there as a very good friend to me, and helps me through whether it's working it out or you know a project that I'm working on. He will help me with everything. Um, so I have really appreciated that. That has helped our mar marriage quite a bit. But, uh, teenage years, our older son seemed to just blow 
through and do all the right things and be very respectful, all the things that you want your children to do and behave in, in, the, in that manner because we had set a very good example. We, Drew had shown the respect for me, I had shown respect for him, we had an enormous amount of love for each other and we were what you would say textbook couple you know working our jobs making a home for our children and um, when our middle son turned to his 12 13th year he, he what well, we had noticed something different about him earlier on but I'm, I'm i was a very calm mother so nothing really rattled me i was always like things were okay and the, and the kids were okay uh, there was something different, but we did, I didn't know what it was. Um, but I, need, I knew that he needed sp special education. Cause, but I was, even though we hadn't discussed it, I had wanted to look for a school that was for him. Now, I hadn't talked to anyone. No one had told me anything. That was just like within me that I felt he needed some different learning. And maybe, maybe mothers know these things. I don't know. Uh, and so I was trying to do those kind of things, but financially we just weren't able to afford that. Um, when he really started acting out and getting out of hand, um, we took him to the doctors to have find out what's going on. Why is he so, uh, you know, acting out like this? It's uh, part of us not having experienced that with our first child also threw us off because it was such an extreme between the two children. He, uh, the doctors at first said, oh, he's fine, he's smart, he's doing well in school, and just dismissed us. Hmm. But the problems continued to grow with his uh, behavior. Uh, he was outspoken to us. He was uh, uh, kind of challenging, you know, not really uh, bad, but just ch really challenging in every way. It's like he... he I don't know, it just felt like he just kept things out of, up in an upheaval, sort of, in our, in our home. Like always a drama going on with something that he took issue with or... Um, there, there's a name for that, oppositional defiant. Well, you know, now we know. Back then I had no clue to that. And we had not experienced, at least I had not experienced any such behavior in our family. It seemed like everything fell into a, a norm and then, you know, did the usual, took the usual steps to grow up, to go to high school, go to, et cetera. Anyway, we, uh, we took him to the doctors and nothing happened until he acted out right in front of the counselor. He acted out that the counselor could not even control him. Uh, you know, he, the counselor wanted to put him in a straight jacket and we were like, no, that makes no sense. You just you just went from telling us he's smart and all the things, and I'm a straight jack. That was just too much of an extreme. He had like and a temper tantrum. It wasn't really a temper tantrum. It was almost like a, it was a game to him. He, uh, yeah. He, he just turned everything into something funny. It just went out of control, out of context. Yeah. It, and this was a psychiatrist. He just basically laughed at the uh, psychiatrist and laughed in his face, and I'm not taking you know. I'm not taking this seriously, I'm just here because my parents made me be here. Um, yeah. yeah. It, so. And I was trained as a psychologist, but I, but I skewed labeling or classifying it was once you get there, you're there. And But the clinical training I had at the time, which was way back in the early 70s, didn't really include things like compositional disorder. That grew through the uh, DSM uh, over time, you know, and oppositional behavior could be part of any kind of, of uh, of a mental illness, but um, it was typical, you know, Sturm and Drang. I mean, you have that that kind of uh, oppositional stuff. Kids trying their boundaries with their parents, and that's that wasn't uh, so many of us, including myself, viewed as well. Okay, he's just acting out more than anybody else. But he he then he started running away and you know doing drugs and at a very early age, at 13, 14, and and that just really threw a big wrench in our lives. I mean, it was just like, whoa, we were turned upside down. Suddenly we were uh, 
you know, driving through a, a room 50 miles an hour without any lights on. You know, it's just like we, we didn't know where we were going, what was happening, and, and uh, it was very different <laughs> for us. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were definitely thrown, you know, like we were thrown out of our game. Like we, we were a good husband and wife, good parent, parent, doing all the things that we're told are, you know, nice things to keep your family going. Uh, they're concerned about their education, concerned about their health, concerned about, you know, make sure we love them all and address their needs. And yet this thing that happened, it was like a tornado hit our house and we had no control over it. Yeah. And it hit it so fast that um, we didn't even have a chance to grab him. You know, he had. Uh, I mean, we were see obviously had issues that were going on, but never to the degree when it just hit. It just hit. And in, mm -hmm. in hindsight, how would you label him? Even though we don't like labels. Well, I I get to. I don't know if I can label him, maybe Drew has a label for him, but uh, I, now that I have Gianni, that is the son's son that I am raising, I see those things in Gianni, and I see why I wanted Brett to go to a different, I mean, my son to go to a different school, because uh, I see those so strongly, and they're so, they're so obvious in Gianni, that I have just worked hard. Uh, to love this kid a, a lot more, listen to him a lot more, um, give him his space to be who he wants to be, though at times he may not feel like he has all of it because, you know, a parent must always decide to what extent you let them, your child, do whatever they want. Yeah. Especially when some of those things can hurt them, like computers and how much television and how many, uh, you know, Pokemon games they can watch. Um, so we do, we have more guidance maybe on those things, even though my son growing up didn't really even watch that much television. Uh, but I guess I am using this as an example. We were more tuned into Gianni and to get him help, we're ready to get him help. And uh, I talk to him a lot more, I think, than I did to my kids. I talk a lot to Gianni what the outcome can be and what outcome does he want. To, uh, you know, everything has consequences, so think about it. Not, you know, I don't, he's not forced until, unless something is, uh, he's being irras totally irrational, but most things we just talk um, a lot more. So. He is diagnosed as ADD, and it wouldn't be wouldn't surprise us if our son was also ADD, but I think more like ADHD possibly. His his mind was so fast that we, you know, like I said, we, you got hit with a tornado. He he was fast. He's he was smart. He uh, could see things before you saw them. Wow. So yeah. Um, and and I and I see that in Gianni, but Gianni's a lot more calmer than our son was, and I think that's partially because I've been there. I recognized that he had anxiety early on, and we addressed it and we deal with it from the perspective that this person has anxiety. So you know we have to make sure he understands what's happening to him, and that we're going to be. We're naturally because we're paying more attention. We're doing, uh, I think, him good service by being alert, alerted to it. How did so, your second son evolve? I know your first son became a physician, has done very, very well. What? How did? How did your second son work out of his? Well, our, our second son has not worked out, and, and that's been the problem. He. Uh, uh, back then, I, I really thought he was depressed because he was already self-medicating. He was breaking into our, you know, alcohol and all this stuff if I had any, and you know, so we we made sure there wasn't. But he was self-medicating a lot, and um, 
but then he would also go into these terrors where basically he just took off and he would be angry and very belligerent and very vocal. And so about that time, I thought, okay, let me dig into my clinical brain here. It's not good to do with your own family. And again, you don't want to get a label necessarily because then it takes on a whole other dimension that may or may not be right. But I had said back then I thought he was bipolar and exhibiting bipolar kinds of tendencies. And, and that's about the age. I mean, bipolar is one of these, uh, you, you're not, you, know, you may be born bipolar, but the onset and, and in terms of how that, that um, uh, really presents itself, the efficacy of such a diagnosis isn't even that because that's when that behavior presents. You don't know, is it depression? Is it, is it you know, mania? And, and, and to merge the two together, take some, some pattern of behavior and some cycling, and that was starting to present itself. So that, that's kind of where I went, and eventually he was diagnosed uh, bipolar. But the, the caveat in all of that was because of his serious drug use, and he was a, I mean, he was an addict beginning with alcohol and, well, marijuana, I guess, if he could be addicted to that, but he went into pills and eventually became a heroin addict, and, and then became a, um, you know, he eventually got off of that, but got, got into cocaine and, and crack, and, and then eventually, um, what's the one now that's a big deal around here? Um, Opioids? Hmm? Opioids? Oh, yeah, any, anything opioid. I mean, any, any, he, if there was a, uh, if there was anything around, he would take it and abuse it and, you know, and get into it. But the, because of that behavior that he was not functioning, he had a job for a while, he was functioning kind of, and then he would lose the job and because he spent all his money on drugs and alcohol and wouldn't show up to work and that sort of stuff. And uh, so, so he was a runaway, and, uh, you know, that, uh, Clear run away from about 13 until 17, 18, and we learned a lot about the law back then because in Council Bay, we, well, you have to call in any night he's out there and tell us, and, uh, you know, when you get him, you have to do this, this, and this, and so we were religious about, okay, our son's still a runaway, and, uh, you know, he spent a little time in juvenile hall, and did, we, he went through a number of rehabs, none of which worked, and, um, and so I think it's fair to say that he, and to this day, and now is homeless. He has been homeless for years. And by choice. He doesn't really seem to, to mind it. He lives with friends, you know, so he he uh, finds friends to stay with for, for some time and a girlfriend here and there, but um, he's just as content being in a tent uh, in a field or, you know, living under an awning at a, at a building in, in town. And so, I, you know, that, that to us still is kind of like, well, today he doesn't seem as much an addict. There are times he seems to be, um, I'll just say, drug-free in the sense of hard drugs. You know, because they can really show and alter a person uh, behavior and his affect. But it's it's still there. The the behavior is there. The affect is still there. And sometimes we run into situations where he's just coming out coming out of control. And like, okay, see you. We do try to maintain contact, and especially for Gianni's sake, so that he knows his birth father. Um, he views him, I think, more as like a big brother, a person to hang out with and for an hour or so once a week. But, um, you know, they, because we've really been the true parents since Gianni was three months old, he's, we've raised him and now adopted him. But the point is, he's... Our son has not come out of that, and I, I always often view, at least I've viewed this together often, often, how did we miss that much? And then even when we kind of were getting it, he was so far gone, we couldn't get him back, we, because he wasn't going to trust that we were helping him, where he was just, hey, this is fun, I'm living a life, I'm having a blast. And, um, you know, and yet I look at him and say, it was easy, I did, but I don't know how he does it. What what about lithium and the bipolar drugs? Has he tried them and didn't he, like he them? Tried, he didn't like it because he felt quote too normal. He didn't like being normal. Wow. So he he just stopped taking it, and uh, and there was a there was a significant change in his behavior. It's like oh, we have our son back. Yeah. But he wasn't going there. So. Well, I think he believed that any drug other than the ones he was choosing to take. <laughs> were doing harm to him. 
So that was the <laughs> it's big kind of thing. backwards. Yeah, lithium. It was like it's harming my body, but we're like, okay, but you're, it's helping you. You know, we see it at all cost. Uh, it didn't matter to him. Yeah, the, the drugs that helped. So he kind of was hooked on the, the, the mania part, the mania part. Yeah. 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 No, it, it, it helped him bring that down. And, you know, another thing we learned was when my older son, and he would go to the high school, uh, the older son went right into class, and the younger son went through the front door to the back door and went across the street to a skate park all day. <laughs> They drove and drank and hung out with a bunch of, you know, other people like him. And so we get visits from the Truman Show. We had no idea. And, you know, so, so here's, the, here's the other interesting, almost, uh, you know, world of opposites. Our three children, all three are fairly bright. We like to believe that because we're parents. Are, of course, our other kids are bright, right? But he was the brightest. Wow. And he was the most creative. Wow. For sure. For sure. Very clever. Yeah. The um, oldest one worked hard for his grades. This one just went to school, soaked it up, and got his test. But I think in part he was bored. Uh, and he'd go to school and just like there was nothing really hooking him in the eyeball, nothing really stimulating to him. It was like, oh, I went there and I know this stuff already, and they're making me put it on a piece of paper and bring it back to him. What's the point of this? I'd rather go to a skate park and get out. You know, so. It was never a question of could he do the work. It became a question of why I just don't want to do the work. Hmm. It's, not, it's petty stuff. I don't bother me with this stuff. The hmm. interesting thing is, Gail, like in fourth and fifth grade, he became interested in music. He just picked up an instrument and started playing it. We were, you know, Drew was very impressed with having music background, you know, so it wasn't just like, oh, I'm so proud of my son. Drew knew he had a really good ability to play an instrument that he chose and uh, he he was playing in groups and promoting not taking drugs um, <laughs> so I don't know where uh, in junior high I know I think he, he came across this one kid who kind of there was no mother at home father was a musician I mean a you know, uh, who played in the rock and roll group. Or, uh, no, no, all of it, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> um, he found this person and went to his house kind of after school, so we didn't know, you know, after school he just headed over there and there was a lot of alcohol there, apparently, at their disposal. And that's, that's a very marked point uh, that I remember where we began to lose him. So whatever it was he was, we will truly won't know because he once he hit the alcohol, he was totally out of control and uh, yeah. not reachable. Mm -hmm. That brain isn't functioning. Yeah. You can't handle the alcohol. I mean, arguably you can't handle alcohol at any age, but especially the amount he was doing at that age is, is not fully formed. As we all know more about brain development now than we did even back then, but. Um, and just from a contextual point of view, when Aziz and I met, I was a music major and she was an art major. I, I then left college and switched to psychology. Um, not sure why, but there I was. I'd never taken a course in it, found it interesting, <laughs> and I off in there. So, yeah. so how did your third child deal with the drama of the high-achieving firstborn, the acting-out secondborn? What was her role? In, in I always felt that she was kind of in the middle, you know, she really enjoyed her um, older brother's intellectual uh, and kindness and just more st structured and, uh, and not, not having, and the steadiness, that's a good word, steadiness. But she also enjoyed the creativity and the fun loving the second brother was. So she got along with both, but probably more so with the second one. And uh, she also became a little defiant in her teenage years, you know, wearing a lot of the dark clothes and the dark makeup and trying to find herself. 
but always had good friends and uh, she always did well in school. Um, you know, teenage years were tough with her too. But, um, she somehow was able to come out of it without uh, any damage. And is she living with you now with her two kids? She is. She lives with us. Um, she's, um, she had gone, you know, after she received her master's in international policy, she went off to Peru to work out there and worked for several years and then met someone, Baird had a child, and she's back home with us because things didn't quite work out there. Or they're still good friends. They might patch things up someday, we don't know. Uh, but she's, meantime, she's got two boys to raise, and she's very much involved with her boys and uh, wants to be there. She doesn't want to leave them. Um, and that's, she's lucky she had that choice because, you know, we can provide for her to be here. How do you work out the roommate issues of cooking and cleaning with three kids and three adults in one household? <laughs> Well, that's quite interesting, <laughs> and I and I say that because I grew up, and I grew up in Pakistan. I grew up with three aunts and three uncles in the house. Well, yeah. two aunts. One of them was my mom. Well, um, it's a huge house. It yeah. was it was a huge home, and one aunt took the responsibility for cooking and cleaning the entirety of it, and she didn't want anybody else to do it because no one could do it as well as she did it, which probably was true. And then my mother had her own duties that she fit into, and then the younger sister usually looked after the kids. And so having that background that you can live in one house, you can all get along, you can have these little jobs, you know, uh, to fit in as a team, teamwork. And maybe this is why Drew, I'm so attracted to Drew. He's an excellent team player. Um, but anyway, as uh, my daughter has come back, she is so different, I think, in some ways for me. In some ways, we're very much alike. I love her artistic nature. I love her, her very open-minded, loving, kind, spiritual person that she is. But she, when she went to... Uh, another country and lived there. She's adapted another way, another cooking uh, style and eating. Different, just different times and different way of eating. So we do struggle with that, however, and we've struggled with that for several years now. But we are now coming closer together. We are kind of blending the two. It's taken a long time, and I think because there was a lot of resistance on both sides. So, but now it's, I guess the gel is the word, uh, jelly into this melting pot of all these different ways that we have both learned. Uh, I don't necessarily cook traditional food all the time. Uh, I've over the years learned to cook Italian food, uh, you know, American cuisine and other things. Um, so it's not even... Like, we, in our house, you, it's not like, oh, okay, we're going to make spaghetti and meatballs today or anything. We just don't know what kind of meal we're going to get here. Yeah, it's always something different. And sometimes there will be two different yeah. meals being cooked. You know, so that we, that when we know that her boy's not going to eat what we're preparing, we just know she's going to prepare them something. something yes. And uh, vice versa. So it's, uh, but at times we all eat the same meal, depending on what it is. So all the boys like it when I barbecue chicken or do teriyaki or whatever. They like that, so they'll all eat that. So those nights when we do that. And they like to eat the salmon and rice and other things. But there are other things like that are more traditional Pakistani meals like chicken curry and whatnot that they want no part of. <laughs> and so, Which is like... So then Johnny's sitting there with us, and he's eating it, but he's like, well, how come I have to eat I want to eat what they're eating. So, <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of sharing, but I think uh, at times we feel like sometimes we're in a fast-order uh, restaurant where we have to 
figure out how to get this cooked while something else is getting cooked or shift it, you know, so somebody's cooking earlier, somebody's cooking later, but it works out. You well, know, you I, at first we were kind of, we should all eat the same thing, we're all here together, it's more economical, we'll just, you know, suck it up and do it, but that, that didn't work, and like, okay, well now we're all just more accepting of we have different appetites, different times to eat, different kind of food we enjoy, some crossover, some don't, that's just the way it is. But you know, that's very difficult and hard on a household. Um, my kids grew up eating what I cooked, and I and I had a list of about seven meals that I made Monday through Sunday, Sunday and that got repeated every week. But, so the, very but the kids, I mean, they looked forward to their meals. They ate vegetables. They ate everything. And I think it's today the way we feed our kids is an issue more than you know what we're cooking. They grew up on chicken nuggets, you know, or other things, and those, they, they don't want to eat vegetables. It's, it's kind of strange to me, but I think the philosophy of this is what's cooked, uh, this is what's for dinner, and we're all going to eat it, is a much better philosophy and a way to go than, oh, we'll cook you whatever you want, because now we're in the kitchen a lot, a lot more than we want to be. So does whoever cooks wash their dishes? Is that how you do dishwashing? That's how it is here, yes. And what about cleaning the house? Well, majority of it is on me because I'm very particular about how I clean and, and maybe that's not always, um, that's, or maybe, I, maybe my opinion is so high. To <laughs> You're like your aunt. Home. Your older <laughs> aunt. <laughs> My aunt, you're right. I get called that a lot. <laughs> but yeah. your aunt, yeah. 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 No, I mean, we all pitch in, and I, and I do what I can. I, I'm, I'm the chief pots and pans watcher because uh, I'll do more scrubbing. And, I, you know, I, we all pitch in. I cook, and Aziza cooks, and we, both, we all clean up. I try to take as much load in the kitchen off of the, my bride, especially because, you know, one of us has spent some time with Gianni and the boys, or we'll do different things together, but um, I'll just try to take that load off as much as I can. I can't do it all the time, but I do what I can. And we also clean more, but a lot, I think it's fair to say Ziza does more than cleaning. And, you know, we're like, okay, boys, we try to get them to clean up, and they get a little vacuum and clean the crumbs up on the table. So they're learning a little chores, but... You know, of course, it's not consistent. They're not that age where this is just their task and they do it, but they're getting there. Um, and just being more aware, okay, there's six of us in this house. And we can't act as though all the dirt on the floor, all the stuff that we're mopping up is of one person. We're only three of us. It's all six of us. Because we, other than our bedrooms, us all share space. So sometimes that gets a little frustrating, but... We, we work it out, and so there will be times our daughter is cleaning up, and there will be times Aziz is cleaning up, and then there's times Aziz is cleaning up, and then there's times Aziz is cleaning up, and then <laughs> I'm cleaning up, so yeah. So. <laughs> well, in the end, uh, you know, people step up for different things, like uh, our daughter will do errands, and, um, you know, when we had to do our fire uh, preparations and everything, She's like right on top of it, you know, whether it's packing, organizing, and whatnot. So in different areas, she pulls up. She, uh, you know, so you just have to, like, looking back at my mother's family, the three sister managed to figure out what they were going to do because there was one sister who knew what she wanted to do. She knew she was going to be the cook. She knew she was going to clean, and no one else was going to do it. <laughs> so gave the other two other options to choose, but she, the middle sister, always complained about the other two. They didn't do enough. <laughs> so I think it's the same story here. I am the middle child. I am the middle <laughs> sister of my mom. I do complain and criticize if things aren't clean <laughs> enough. <laughs> So people stay away from me, you know, and I do I do that to myself, I guess. But they're my daughter is a very, very valuable person. She has an, um, she naturally is a teacher. She talks to these kids in a manner 
That is just really impressive. It's like, I know I didn't do that with you, so where did you learn that from? She's just very good. The language is very good that she uses. And she also is very good with ideas and her creative. Even though I am the artist and the, who likes to paint, her artistic nature is, is really, to me, exquisite. When she creates things, to me, they're masterpieces. Um, I, I see her struggling with them and wants to get it perfect. We'll do it over and over again. And, when we're yeah. and I think she gets that from both of us. Where really my my nature is to be easygoing and more flowing, you know, letting things flow. And and I realized that the perfectionist that my husband is, and then I see it in my older and my younger children, child. Uh, it's it's a learning. I learn from them. You know, that's a different way of approaching your end product. Uh, just because I do it in a way that relaxing and more loving and more flowing, uh, that's not always the right way to do it. But you said you're also a structured person, so you have Very. enough similarities that it works. If, if, if it's true that there's karma and that we, our spirits pick life partners to grow and evolve, what would you say your karmic lessons have been as a couple? Who wants to go first? <laughs> you go first. Okay. <laughs> you know, this is, uh, I don't know how many people really think about those kind of things, but I actually think about it a lot. Um, or at least come, comes across to me in a lot of areas as I go through my day or my life. As a very young person, I always had a very, very strong feeling that God loves me and I just, God being this powerful, not another human being, but this powerful force in the universe, really loves me and, and that things will, you know, that I'll do okay in, in life. So having always had that in my heart and mind, um, I met Drew. And of course, that brought me a lot of turmoil uh, with my family and not accepting. Uh, but it also brought me a lot of love. Uh, you know, obviously, the love between a man and a woman is so different from me. Parental love. I, I really, truly felt loved every single day by this man. And... <laughs> Um, but kindness, it's not just, you know, we're not talking about uh, uh, sexual love, we're talking about, he, he's worked with me, he's, he's worked kindly with understanding, at times where I'm sure I was very frustrated to be with, but it's, it's just amazing to have that kind of human being in your life every day, that when things go wrong, they'll step up and amazingly back you up and work with you and get you through and, and be patient be patient for that yeah. so so i feel like karma that is same karma as i felt loved with god i feel loved in this life uh, loved by my partner and i think that's a gift i can't imagine how people get through it without that. In, in Hinduism terms, it's bhakti yoga. It's the yoga of devotion, the path of devotion. Okay. I don't know much about that. <laughs> sounds like I should be learning that. <laughs> Drew, what would you say? If there was a karmic reason your spirit yeah. picked your wife, what, what did you want to learn, give, grow? Well, again, when, when I... When I first met Aziza and her aura and that sense of who she was, very kind and very uh, caring, because she was a good listener and a good talker too, but Aziza is all heart. She speaks with her heart. She, she bleeds all the time, but this is where I have this feeling. And I tend to be far more uh, rational, though, I, though as a musician, as a jazz player, so I always played out the lines, 
But, you know, in other things, I was much more um, precise and, you know, achieving perfection. What what helped me with the with my brother was he, you know, he encouraged my wanting to do well and, and to do things the best I could. But the best I could didn't have to be perfect. That was the best I could. And allowing that, sometimes I'm going to fall short. <laughs> she certainly allowed me to fall short many times. But... But finding out that, you know, I didn't have to be so hard on myself and I have to count on her to be supporting me um, because there is no such thing as perfection. All that is is striving towards just being better and doing better. And so in that way, hmm, I guess the karma please would be that Aziza basically helped me to become a better person. I thought I was okay, but she made me better. <laughs> I think what we're really saying is whatever was important to us in life, we really do connect on those points. And that's probably what has carried us through it, you know, how we believe in religion, how we believe in relationships, and how much we love our children, even though they didn't take the path we may have directed them towards. Um, we're still happy. Yeah. We have our love. That gets us through it. It doesn't mean that our kids don't love us. It's they're different. They, you know, I guess I, yeah, yeah. They, they're different. They've chosen different paths. They, uh, well, uh, for example, my oldest son, he is so good with his wife that she clearly knows that she chose him because of that reason. For I may have not known that I chose you for that reason. But she clearly knows um, that she chose him for his personality, the way he is. He's very calm. Yeah, definitely a balance of Drew and I, a calm and a hard worker, very hard worker, and works to get along with his wife rather than take his own, you know, stance, I think. Which a lot of time I think couples get stuck. Oh, this is how my family does it. And, and I'm going to stick my feet in the, in the ground where Drew and I have, though at times we felt that way, we didn't let that be an issue that crosses us the rest of the day. No. No, so, and, and, and your sense of humor, that's so important. Drew, it really, it, through the hardest time, sometimes gets me mad, but... We'll always have something funny to say about the situation, which is great. <laughs> which I love his sense of humor. It's very witty. Um, it can be dry. <laughs> and sometimes it, it's at the expense of me. But <laughs> well, more often, that, that, more often at my own expense. And I'm pretty self deprecating. But the, the, a lot of the humor really is sometimes in the dryness is I'm just looking for other possibilities. Well, okay, well, this is where we are. But it could be. It could be this. You know. Like, okay. Yeah. Right. We're, it's not so bad. So, you know. We don't. We don't hold grudges. I noticed that. Yeah. Right. Um, not only with each other, even with other people, we let go or walk away from them. But uh, it might stew us for a while. But in the long run, we say, okay, that was not a good thing for us. We don't. We're not the kind of people who go and take revenge on anyone. Uh, and I think that's been a healthy, yeah. helped us have a healthy relationship. Yeah, sure. We're not in, uh, involved. We're not spiteful. In, yeah, we're not spiteful. We're like, okay, this is how things went. We're mad about it now, but that is for that. Well, I, I joke um, often uh, that um, I think I am, and sometimes as even we're, we're inherently too lazy to carry around all that anger. and <laughs> You have to work too hard. <laughs> to be mad or angry or, or spiteful. To me, it's just too much energy and it's not well spent, it's not well directed, it doesn't get us anywhere. So, so we just don't do that. <laughs> and I think that's helped us with our son's situation. You know, it's been, it's, it, it's a heartache when you lose a child to addiction, but they're still alive, they're still in your life. Um, you know, kind of have come to terms with it. He he really seems okay most of the time we see him now. He seems fine. We we don't suspect anything, but we don't understand why he would still live in the streets. 
Um, but we accepted that that's the choices is made despite our advice, our help. Um, that's his nature. There's, and maybe that's what who we humans are. We expect everyone to have a roof over their head, and we think that that's the safest thing, uh, and everyone should want it. Um, but maybe that's not what some people want, and, and you can't force them. Hmm. Um, as working as an administrator in universities, I would imagine there's a fair amount of politics, and oftentimes there's parties and spouses are involved. I wonder how that's, uh, what part of your marriage has been the university politics and schmoozing and social get-togethers and that kind of thing. Has that been a factor or not? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. And, that's, and so I'll just put it out there. My, my own experience is the, the higher I went in administration, the less connection there was with that kind of socializing. Um, certainly um, with your own staff, because there's too much possibility from all. You had dinner at Drew's house, so you're his favorite. I mean, that kind of, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I think with university events were fine. We very seldom had uh, events that involved people. We might bring the whole staff over, like when I was not a vice president, but being a vice president was harder to do that. And, uh, and even as cabinet officers, we, we kind of, we were social in the, in the sense that we'd be at events and work together, but we did not put that into our personal life. I, mean, I tried to keep that outside, and though sometimes I brought it home, of course, and Aziza endured it, it was particularly difficult. We learned a couple of times over the, the years when, you know, I was dealing with very big budget reduction issues and worried sick that people were going to lose their jobs and lose their homes and all that. So, so I was not fun to live with. But trying to keep it separate. I, I didn't want to bring it home. And I, I know if, uh, in the beginning I would just uh, really talk to Aziz or, or go on or be upset about whatever. And I could see Aziz was getting upset that she didn't want to live my job at home. She didn't want to have to hear that kind of stuff. So I, I made a very conscious decision not a long time ago. It's okay, work is work. I'll give very little updates or we do this, we do that, or this is really bothering me and I'm going to work on it. And not, not have that be in the room with us. So when I'm home, I tr as much as possible, I'm home. Emails come, texts come, calls come, and she knows, but it's not occupying the entire day. And if it's going to, I let her know. Now, this is a big deal for me. I'm probably going to spend more time necessary. And now tomorrow I begin yet again my another assignment at UC San Diego, but it's all remote for now, and so I'll be hours, you know, on on the computer with in meetings and. Uh, but it won't be all day. So that'll be a new experience for us because before when I was working at UC San Diego, I used to only work at home from home on Fridays. So I'd leave early Monday morning and come back Thursday night. But Fridays I still had meetings and we would do that and other times too. Um, but limited. So I usually was done by noon, but then I might get some calls like from the Chancellor or somebody at two in the afternoon, something blown up, can I help out? But by and large, uh, it wasn't as much uh, of an intrusion, if you will. So this will be an adjustment for us as an example, because no one else is in the room. I'll be in there with people on, on calls much like this, except there might be 20 of us, there might be two of us, there might be five of us. My first meeting tomorrow is four of us at 8 o'clock, and I have two of us meeting at, at 9.30, so that sort of thing. Um, but when I've done that, I'm more inclined, I'm just as inclined to say, okay, I've turned my computer off, I'm done. I know I may get some text and some stuff that we'll follow up on, but I try not to let that occupy the giant lion's share of our time. Now, Zizi may think differently about that, but, you know, I have a different experience, but that's what I try to do. So, so I try, so, so there was never an expectation that Zizi be at every event, there was never an expectation that we'd be 
host and hostess to lots of people, uh, even though there were a lot of people who would want to socialize because I became aware a long time ago that uh, a good colleague of mine who was one of my mentors, when he became my friend, said, you know, Drew, the one thing I've realized that it's much lonelier being at the top or near the top because you almost can't socialize. You can't put yourself out there because there's too many people reading into that or, or taking advantage of it, frankly. And he was right. So, yeah. so, I mean, that may not seem like what it is from the outside. So a lot of the events on campus, yeah, I'd go. Or even some events off campus, I would go. And so, as he was joining me for many of them, but not all. And, uh, but we didn't bring him home. I did not bring him home. Home was home. I think my hands were full. I didn't need to go to many events that I really didn't need to be at. And honestly, I'm, I'm not sure if I enjoy some of that. I'm not part of what goes on at a university. Just because I'm his wife, I, I didn't, uh, I'm not a nosy person, so I didn't get into, you know, like, oh, I want to get to know the president's wife or or so-and-so. Um, yeah, it's, I, was, I had enough to do. I didn't need to be involved in university issues. Right, that could get engulfing. Um, this is a kind of a footnote question. Um, is this is about Generation Y and Z. I've been doing work on, on them and their activism, and people have accused, especially Y, of being um, teapots, fragile, can't handle stress, helicopter parents, take over everything, call the prof, my kid got a C, what's going on? They shouldn't get a C. And that they're anxious, depressed. I wonder if if you've seen changes like that over the generations when you've been doing university work. What, what do you think of Gen Z? <laughs> well, so, so here's my experience over the years. I mean, it's, and it's, it's interesting because uh, our generation, the baby boomer generation, kind of introduced the whole idea of uh, no, no longer interested in, in loco parentis. You know, the idea that uh, parents were involved in guiding stuff, which had been part and parcel uh, of everyone's experience up until really the 60s and some landmark law cases where uh, privacy was, uh, you know, granted students. I mean, so parents couldn't have access to their academic record. They didn't have the right to be involved in this and the other thing. And, and we, we wanted it that way. Um, and so there's a certain irony there that some of the students come to school now, um, especially the last 10, even 15 years, I often use the joke that the students show up with all their stuff, you know, now a computer, we didn't have that back then, uh, and their lawyer's business card. You know? <laughs> but they have a direct line of mom and dad and texting, and I had students literally come in my office and uh, would already have their mom or dad on the phone and saying, well, my mom is want to talk to you. Well, then she can call me later. But I made this meeting with you, and I, I don't have an authorization from you to, uh, to have her present. Well, I can do that. Right, but we're not going to do that this minute. <laughs> and so the meeting would end. And that was news to the students and news to the parents. And I had many conversations with parents saying, you know, mom and dad, you've done a good job. You have to trust that we're doing the best we can. You may not like what we're doing and, and may not like that we're not... She, they're not getting the grades you want, or they're not getting what you think is a fair shake. Uh, if there's an issue discipline-wise, but this is a lesson they need to learn. Maybe they didn't learn it at home, but they're going to learn it here. Because at some point, you're not going to be... I, I literally had a parent who went and called a superintendent when their daughter was offered a job as a teacher, and they thought they didn't want to pay her enough. Of course, the daughter lost that job. The parents still didn't learn, but the daughter did, you know, and, and she had relied on mom and dad interceding and everything. So, so they, so a lot of the students today are more codependent on mom and dad to do their bidding for them, and less inclined to want to uh, learn how to figure out how to support themselves or how to make the case for themselves, uh, because they figure mom and dad are going to be there. They're going to come in and and beat on the vice president or the principal of their school or whatever, and it evidently has worked. 
until they got to to a certain place. So I, I find I found that gradually creeping in, but uh, literally my last year or two there, I was like I just can't believe it. I mean, I just the joke was just expect it was sad that they're going to come in with their phone on and they're recording you and all that stuff, and that's the nature of it. I understand that, but you also have the ability to draw boundaries. As a minister, you can say, I'm sorry, I don't have authorization written on our form from your mom and dad, from you to your mom and dad, allowing them in here. And oftentimes, a student wanted that for that moment, but didn't want it after that. <laughs> then they had to sign yet another form. They went, I don't want mom and dad involved. So, you know, so there's a certain amount of bureaucracy that actually helped protect uh, those kind of things. And, and I'll just explain to the parents that this is how we do things, that I had to abide by the law and, and remind many of them that are my age that we created that law and we benefited from that law. And so will their charges, but they have to let them grow up and be part of that in order to fight their fights. Wait, is there so, any, any you, difference in gender in terms of girls' parents or boys' parents being more protective or no kind of gender differences? I did not see a real gender difference. Not at all. No. <laughs> um, and with, if I had a nickel at the right time, I heard, oh, come on, Vice President, boys will be boys. Yeah, that's why your son's in trouble, Dad, because of your, your notion that boys will be boys. But boys don't get to touch girls. That's called physical or sexual assault, and that's what we're dealing with. So, hmm. And that hasn't changed because it seems to me that uh, Gen Z is more activist, more political, more like they're turning out to vote. So yeah. they, the young, the teens, the early twenties now seem to me more um, less self-centered, more concerned about the social issues. I don't know. What do you think? I think many of them are. I don't think it's fair to say that all of them are. And I, and I think many that are, that are very pass, passionate about it and almost to a point of their own dogma where it gets to them, well, why do you want to bother me with this stuff? This is what's really important. This is what I'm doing. Okay, so you're demonstrating, but you don't get to destroy property, as an example. You don't get to limit people's path into that building. Just because you want to let them know how you feel. You can let them know how you feel about them, but you can't violate the laws or the procedures that are set up. And they, so they, they just didn't understand why there was anything limiting them. Because up to a certain point, again, they had not been limited. Uh -huh. There are limitations. So, yeah, I, th I think they can get blinded by that uh, on the one hand. But on the other hand, I applaud it. In some respects, what many of them are doing, what we were doing in the 60s and the early 70s. Right? I mean, it's kind of a, it's cycled back. But man, them bring mom and dad in the room. I would have never brought my mom. And dad. <laughs> Mine definitely they, never. They would have said, "Not only are you not going to go there, so you're going to stay home now. You're done." You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a, yeah. Because the baby boomer said, "Don't trust anybody over 30. and these <laughs> the, these guys don't say that. Push that age up as we got older. Right? <laughs> 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 oh, that's interesting. Um, okay, a few more questions. How do you keep romance, um, sparkle, alive over the... How many years have you been married? 45. Over 45 years. How do you keep it interesting and juicy? I think romance comes when you love each other. So it's always there. Um, you know, it's the person you can find in, believe in, and it's the person that I think that I have committed to for the rest of my life. So, I think that's, for me, I don't, I don't think of anyone else, so all my love is here. Um, yeah. yeah, but there's little things, like, like, little silly things that you expect anyway, but okay, so it was Lisa's birthday, but we happened to be down my son's house time, and we celebrated like a family would, but Aziz and I didn't celebrate, but we did celebrate a couple of nights ago, you know, we went to... Uh, well, we did, we, yeah. we went down to Bodega Bay. Right, Bodega Bay. We, okay. we had a little date, we, so, we were, yeah. Yeah. The, the kids all stayed home, took care of everything, and told us to go do whatever we wanted to do. And in this uh, 
coronavirus environment. So we went out to Bodega Bay, we walked together. It was nice. Given that we're raising a child at this age, um, we have very little free time. And I, honestly, I thought this was going to be my dream where we are going to, you know, our kids were going to grow up, have a happy life just like we did. And we were going to spend our time in the garden and walks, you know, bike, go bike riding, uh, go travel. None of that really came true for us because we're tied down with the child and, uh, and welcoming back additional family members. Um, so, but that's okay. We don't, we, no. we don't not even one day sit back and say, I'm mad that, you know, I'm not getting to do that. Um, and yet, you know, he's traveled to Italy with us. He's traveled to Peru with us. We went to visit and welcome our firstborn grandson there. And, uh, you know, the, um, he has, he likes going to Petaluma to visit with his other cousins. And he enjoyed, we'd go to the East Coast and my mother lived there. And we'd go back and forth and Aziz's family is there. But, um, so we, we don't let it get totally in the way, but it is, it is much more intentional and very much like, well, we're, we're behaving no differently than younger parents with younger kids in so many respects. So we, we do a little thing, but, you know, but Aziza has a great big, she has two huge green thumbs. She's really good with plants. So at one point she's been saying, see, I need a pot or I need a bench, I need something as an example. And at one point at the at the uh, farmer's market, this guy has his little bench out there and telling me it's $150, and I'm looking at it and saying, yeah, that's not going to hold very much. And so, uh, so I built her one, you know, oh. so a little like that. So, you know, I spent much less money, and I think it's after you, but I parked the car on it, probably overdid it, but but stuff like that, and we, we just do things like that for each other. Well, let's just, just help each other out. But I think it just reinforces our love. We mean little surprises here and there. Of, of, uh, you know, of, uh, gee, we're going to dinner. Oh, good. Uh, where are we going? And you know, but we've been we've been together and doing it so long. We don't expect any any surprises, and we don't expect anything from each other. And and we know that we're going to do something that works for both of us. And uh, but we enjoy our company no matter what we're doing. You know, no matter how much I drive her crazy, she still enjoys my company. <laughs> so this goes back to karma. We're happy despite what falls apart around us. Yeah. And I think we, it's not so much, oh, oh you're here. It, it's just in us. It's just there. It's who we are. Not because... Anything I did for him or he did for me, I think we're individual as individuals have need for happiness. Well, I shouldn't say need because I think it just exists within us, and so we don't. We're not looking for happiness. We have it. Yeah. I think that's our karma. Yeah. Hmm. So you don't ever get bored with each other. We have so much to do. <laughs> Something get bored. We have we three like, we like boys. to see if that ever happens. <laughs> <laughs> so we have three boys running around. We have um, so many movies and things we have never seen that you know we probably would sit down and watch if we had the time. Uh, we have so many interests, and we're, and we're always creating work. I realized that through our life that. Drew and I have a habit of creating more and more work. Like what? Like, for instance, gardening. We'll go out there and we'll buy plants and we're always moving plants or planting plants. Um, same thing inside the house. I'll be moving things around, furniture's being rearranged. Um, you know. What did you do by a plant? You mean buying a plant? <laughs> <laughs> But my plants seem to just grow. I didn't even have to buy them. They just, they I grow the plants from the plants. It's amazing. Hmm. Um, Gianni is 10. How old is he now? Yeah, he's 10 now. Yeah. And how old are the, his cousins? His cousins are, Bima's going to turn nine, and the little guy is six. And so do I, they, 
do they um, play together well, or are they typical siblings and hassle and bicker? Oh, oh, oh. No, we, they have. There's times where they'll play all day together. And we don't even know they're in the house. Wow. They're quiet. They're playing. They're getting along. They're um, Gianni and his cousin Bima have incredible creative minds. They have plays and they go back and forth, you know, with the plays. And it just amazes me the things they say and what's happening. And they just build on each other. And it seems like they know what to say and what to do. Uh, and the little one, of course, has learned from them and it, it plays like that. But they also fight and argue about the dumbest things at times. And, they're they're uh, more like brothers and cousins. Yeah. I, mean, I often refer to them as tres hombres. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then his so, and when he's with when he's with his uh, other cousins in Petaluma, so so Sienna is the oldest. Our only granddaughter uh, is eleven. Gianni's ten, and then comes Bima, and then comes Sienna's brother Luca, and then comes Rai. So it's almost like eleven, ten, nine, eight, now nine, and and six. Cute. So it's kind of fun to watch, but they all get along really well. They you know they love each other's company. And, uh, yeah, it's fun to watch. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> if, if we're going to kind of summarize this, what advice would you give to a couple that's just getting married? Based on your 45 experience, years of experience, what would you say to them? Make sure you do this and don't do that. But I think people ought to, as a zine I have throughout, make, make sure that, each of us knows what's important to one another and try to honor that, not try to change another person to, well, you might think that's important, but I think this is important, that's better than yours, so you're going to do it my way. And there's always that give and take. And I, I see a lot of people uh, early in, in their relationships trying to change or mold the other person, like, well, okay, he lets go out with all his guy friends, but I stopped that. But now we're getting divorced. Okay. <laughs> oh, let's talk about that. Um, you know, but but really look at how do you celebrate the other person's differences, and how do you try to? It's not even accommodate, not the right word, but how do you really help to reinforce that and and try to engender that in some way, facilitate stuff, even if it's not something that you're excited about. You know, so I know there's a, this is a there's not the least bit excited about some of the things that that I may be doing, or she'll come out and, and try to watch and learn if I'm working on a car and doing whatever I may be doing. But, um, you know, she, uh, she, and, and it's better, and it's not even she endures it, it just wants to be there because I'm there, and I know that, and vice versa. Uh, you know, there may be some things, as he's sewing something, and I have about as much interest in sewing as, as uh, well, no one. But, um, but I've learned to run a line on her up and, and try to help her fix it in the machine or whatever. Uh, and I'll, I'll watch her paint, you know, stuff like that. So it's, I think it's really not getting dug in. And, and I guess the best way is that you don't have to be totally selfless. But there are times being selfless pays off. But you can't always be selfish either. And so, you, you know, I think people just need to really figure out how do you make that give and take work for both of you. And I guess it's old Mick Jagger, you know, you can't always get what you want. But you're going to figure it out together. Yeah. Yeah. I think, Drew and I have an advantage. We like being with each other. Yeah. I don't, I talk to friends who are married. I don't think they enjoy being with each other. As, I mean, we want to be together all the time, even when we're miserable, even when we're mad at each other. We <laughs> want to be with each other, it's just one of those things. Um, so I think we have an advantage, for sure. But the things that truly help a marriage is being honest and respectful with each other, and I think we always have that. Um, and it helped a lot that Drew has, um, either it was his nature or he has the background with his uh, study of psychology and counseling, um, we, he talks about things, you know, he sees the rational sides of things. Um, so that doesn't mean 
he doesn't tell me sometimes I'm totally crazy, <laughs> which happens once in a while. And, and I usually find a way to come back and say, well, here's my rationale. And, he, yeah. and you know, he listens. It's not like, oh, I, you know, I've heard it already. I don't want to hear you. I, I don't get that. It's, he will listen to it and see my side of it. Well, last no. question is like, do you think you're being a little emotional right now? <laughs> so, you know, but it doesn't matter. You know, we all get emotional about things. But yeah. I think it's like give and take and, and good, open, honest communication. And most importantly, I think, is not judging. You know, because there's a lot goes into all our backgrounds, and it's easy to judge and, and not understand where some of that characteristic or even what I might view or is even my view as baggage got put up with this. But, but it's part of who who came in the room and came into that relationship. So how do you parse that in a way that, okay, well, is this really so bad I can't live with it? And I think some people give up and throw the town too quickly because in many respects they're not being honest, not even with themselves about where they are with this person, and um, they're not communicating well, but mostly then they're judging. And once you start judging, a loss. It's never too late to learn, you know, from other people, from other situations. Um, and I think our last, uh, our, not our last, but our uh, Supreme Court judge, uh, RBG, said it best, you have to have a deaf ear when you're married uh, in some ways. So as much as Drew sometimes says to me that you're not listening, it, it's a good thing. So Drew, did yeah. your, your mother and stepfather have that good, did they have a good marriage that taught you how to listen and be respectful? Well, that's a good question. I, I think they had a, an okay marriage. Um, he was a teacher, librarian in the public schools. My mother worked a little, you know, like clerical jobs here and there. Um, I, I think the unifying force for me was, frankly, my grandmother, you know, who lived with us and uh, taught me a lot because there was certainly differences between her and my mother's husband, my stepfather, uh, and yet they all got along in the house. And I watched how that dynamic worked and learned from that. Because um, my, my stepfather was fairly dogmatic. Um, he was, you know, grew up very poor and, and was very uh, worried about impressions or what people thought or saw of him. Uh, we used to tease him that he was just being too German. You know, then in, in his dogma, but you know, you, you go there, you go down a slippery slope in a hurry. But he was a very proud man, and so he, you know, the fact that he had to accept food from others and clothing from others because his mother and father had separated, or actually his father died, and uh, so his mother was raising him by themselves at a time when mothers didn't do that, and, and uh, so they were dirt poor. So he didn't want to, he, he to acknowledge that or that he grew from that. So, so because he was so proud, sometimes I think that got in the way of the relationship with my mother and even with us, um, in particular with my brother and him, but also with my grandmother. I saw how my grandmother navigated that and how she would listen, but also find a way to interject things in, in a fairly non judgmental way for her, because she certainly had an opinion about things, but you know, she would find a way to to let, her, let him know, well, maybe you ought to think about this a different way, or could it be something different? And put it out there for him to consider. And, yeah, and really. She, yeah, and she had been through quite a hardship in her life. Yeah, yeah but she was uh, very accepting of me right away. She was definitely yeah. the core person that, uh, you know, in that triangle with Drew's mom and stepdad, uh, who were probably not only at each other about this relationship that their son was having, uh, and their opinion about race, she was just like, you know, that uh, Rana, whoever I know, <laughs> is a wonderful girl, but she really liked me, and uh -huh. was very open to me right away. So, Drewy, they didn't have kids it was just you and your brother, and they, your mom didn't have more kids. She, she did have a daughter by him. Oh. Yeah. So she was, but by the time my sister was born, I was 
eight or nine. And so my brother and I were a year apart, so we kind of traveled through life. And my sister, eventually when she was old enough, tied mom. But by the time my sister was, you know, becoming a person, if you will, in, college, in high school, I was halfway down college. Yeah. I'd been away. And so, uh, so, so, you know, we, we started to get along and, and, and all that. But, but also, I think um, we still live the notion that my brother and I were his, you know, another fathers. Uh, there was a definite better relationship with, with our stepfather and, of course, his own daughter, which I accepted, okay, well, that's the way it is. I never thought a big deal of it. Mm -hmm. um, but my grandmother, again, I think was the mitigating factor who taught me to stand back and listen and be accepting. Doesn't mean you have to adopt it or right? that you have to, as, you know, be a pushover or pushed over by it, uh, but that you can stand your ground, too make it known that, well, this is where I am. And you don't have to agree. You didn't have to agree on it. You can agree to disagree. Got and it. That served me pretty well. Um, is there anything else that you think people should know about how to make a marriage last over time that we haven't touched on? I think the usual things that uh, everyone talks about, you know, make time for yourselves. And then, of course, you know, we grew up in a different time than today. One of the things my mother-in-law pointed out to me was, you know, don't forget yourself. And she always said that. And I was like, what is she talking about back then, you know? But I can see where, as a mother, you can get lost, totally lost in taking care of your kids. You're cooking and cleaning. They become daunting tasks to complete. Um, you know, then, and then add the problems with teenage years or a child that has some sort of disability or whatnot can really fully engulf you, you know, or just, you, you know, you would be taken by those problems. You really have to stop each day and say, you know, who am I? Like, like my art is a good example, you know, why did I stop doing that? Why didn't I every day take one hour to do my art? And all my art artist friends tell me that, and yet I have a hard time doing that. I think, I think that's super important, that you do what you want to do, to stay true to who you are. That's another lesson I feel I have learned in the years of experience in my marriage, is that there, I was becoming angry and maybe bitter going through my son's addiction. And I finally said to myself, you know, I'm coming, even though I don't mean to be that way to other people, I'm somehow coming across that way to them. Not the true person I, oh, I am inside. And I'm kind of just acknowledging that, I think that it has helped me a lot. I want to be who I was before to be with you know, I guess a warm mm -hmm. kind and, and and a person who doesn't get oh, flood, flustered by life. Yeah, I mean it took us both so a long time to figure out we've been controller. Right, right. Or pure yeah. the old four seed. But you know, the the real issue was learning to let go. And yet, not draw a person off a cliff. Yeah. Life's going to continue to happen no matter what happens to you. And I think for couples, the, the important thing is remember why you got together with them to begin with. Right. If that is no longer the case, then why not? And ex explore that. You know, what, what changed? And who changed? You know, because the person is the person. And if they're, if they're having a hard time remembering, then they're trying too much to change that person, I think. That's my sense. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely a mistake when you try to change someone. That, right, that's just not going to work. At least I don't think that's going to work. We do that to our own children. We try to change them to oh, you know, fit into this box and that box, and it doesn't work. They are who they are. You can only just pave the road and... And then in, when I say that, I realize that's the road we were paving for our children. Drew and I weren't. You know, we had guidelines, we had boundaries, uh, 
but how did we lose our son on that path? And that's when I come to the conclusion that things will happen. I blamed myself, I blamed Drew, I blamed other people uh, during that process. But now I, I look back and think, there wasn't much we could have changed. There are things, you know, there's home, then there's that outside environment, and then they have their own mind. Own which, you know, yes, I gave them that mind, uh, but that mind has a DNA of how many more people in there. Yeah. Who I don't know. You know, <laughs> you, know you kinda know. Yeah. So 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 the Zen moment is it is what it is. Yeah. And you have to be, you know, accepting of it but not defeated by it. Great. Okay.